Good afternoon, everybody. This is Chris Osborne with First Indiana Robotics. This is our uh, final uh, of our First Indiana virtual conference series coming to you live on our Twitch channel. We've been at it now for several weeks. We want to thank all of our participants. Uh, today, as we wrap up, uh, we'll have Renee back on uh, for, uh, from First Indiana, our president. And we're going to thank our participants and talk a little bit about what's next from First Indiana in terms of our uh, virtual content. Uh, this is not the end of us bringing virtual content to our community. Uh, this is just us wrapping up our uh, live conference series. So we'll have more for that uh, later. Uh, in the meantime, I wanna again, welcome everybody. And first uh, bring out our two guests for our opening session and introduce uh, from our student board of directors, introduce Peyton, uh, who uh, will be running our first session here today uh, and uh, from team 3494, the Quadrangles. So Peyton, welcome, uh, and I'll let you take it from here, okay? Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Peyton Gross. I'm from the First Indiana Student Board of Directors. Joining me today is someone I had the pleasure to meet at the 2019 EAA Air Venture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, Colonel Kim Casey Campbell a senior pilot in the Air Force and the faculty chair of Air Power Innovation and Integration at the United States Air Force Academy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, thanks Peyton, it's great to see you again. <laughs> so when did you first learn that you wanted to pursue a STEM related career? So it's kind of an interesting story for me. Um, in 1986, um, which I know is several years um, before many of you were born, but um, I was watching the Challenger launch, um, the Challenger Space Shuttle launch. Um, and as some of you may remember, that launch ended in disaster and all of the astronauts were killed um, when the shuttle exploded on launch. But there was something about it that I questioned in terms of why were the astronauts so committed to doing something that they would be willing to risk their life for? And it's, it connected with me in a way that I wanted to contribute and do something that was bigger than me, to do something that was more important than myself. And so in that moment, I decided that I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to do something that I was willing to commit my life to, that I was willing to work hard for. And so after talking with my parents about the best way to get there, uh, my dad uh, offered up an idea of going to the Air Force Academy and also becoming a fighter pilot because many of those pilots went on to be astronauts. And so it's kind of an interesting start for me, but I'm really thankful um, to have kind of had that experience and that moment of focusing my life and focusing my kind of my middle school, high school career path uh, to lead me on to kind of what was next. So the Air Force Academy is a challenging environment to get accepted into. How did you structure your early activities pre to prepare yourself for that? Well, I knew that um, to be accepted to the Air Force Academy, you had to be well-rounded. So it wasn't just enough to be good at academics. You had also to focus on extracurricular activities and physical fitness. And so I just did my best to try to involve myself with many activities. Um, I worked really hard in school and my parents joke, you know, I asked them, you know, what it was like when I told them that all of a sudden I wanted to be an astronaut and go to the Air Force Academy. And they said it was fantastic because whereas before, maybe I wasn't as committed and it was a little harder to get me to do homework and focus on school. Um, I suddenly just became very committed because I knew grades were important. Uh, and so I worked very hard at school. I was also into a lot of different sports and just trying to figure out, you know, what I enjoyed, um, but also, you know, how to improve my physical fitness. Um, and then extracurricular activities, everything from volunteering um, to joining the Civil Air Patrol uh, to learn how to fly. Uh, and so I really just tried to focus on that whole well-rounded aspect, but it gave me direction, it gave me focus and purpose uh, and I think, um, you know, in the long run, it really set me up for success at the Academy. So besides your experience with watching the Challenger accident, who or what else has inspired you to pursue this career as well? 
Uh, certainly the astronauts on board the Space Shuttle Challenger, um, but I would say um, a few other astronauts along the way. Um, I got the opportunity to meet Susan Helms, was one of the first um, female military astronauts. And, you know, anytime you can meet someone that uh, is doing something that you want to do and looks like you, it's always really encouraging. And she really encouraged me to go after what I wanted. Um, but I think on a more personal note, um, my parents were both very influential and in just trying to keep me focused on my dreams and goals and staying focused on that. Um, but also I had some really good teachers along the way who encouraged me to think critically. My science teacher, Mr. Wong, uh, was one of those teachers and he just really encouraged us to you know, get outside our comfort zone a little bit, think critically about things. Um, and then also my English teacher and speech and debate coach, uh, Mrs. Kennett, she really encouraged me to go after what I wanted. I did not know when I decided that I wanted to be a fighter pilot that women weren't actually allowed to be fighter pilots at the time. And I kind of discovered along the way as I was doing some research in her debate class about women in the military that that path that I wanted to take wasn't actually open for me. And she just really encouraged me to not let anything stand in my way. And that if that was what I wanted to go for it. And so I'm, you know, I'm thankful for their influence and their impact because they helped me keep me focused on my goals, but also encouraged me, you know, throughout the challenges that I had along the way as well. So you talked about your teachers giving you advice and inspirations. Uh, since most of the people in our audience today are high school students looking to their future now, what is some advice you would give to them and to your younger self? Um, well, this is the same advice I give cadets today at the Air Force Academy. And I think, you know, that it's really important that you work hard to be good at what you do. Um, credibility matters and being good at what you do matters, um, but also have a good attitude, right? Um, to go out and just be good at what you do, but have a good attitude about it. And that goes a long way. And then people are really willing to help you and encourage you. Um, you know, the other thing that I would say is to never quit. Um, I know that maybe sounds a little bit cliche, but you know, I have faced some challenges throughout my career. Probably the very first thing that I faced that was really difficult was um, going to the Air Force Academy was all that I ever wanted. I mean, that was, I had, put all my plans into going to the academy, although my parents very smartly made me apply to some other schools as well. Um, but I actually, um, in April of my senior year, got a rejection letter from the academy that said, you're highly qualified, but so is everybody else. And I'm sorry, you just didn't make the cut this year. And I mean, I was devastated. I, it was all that I had wanted. It was everything that I had worked for. Um, and to be told that I wasn't good enough was hard. Um, but I had some, again, very supportive teachers. Um, I had a liaison officer that I work with at the Air Force Academy, and they just encouraged me to keep going. Uh, my parents uh, specifically just said, you know, don't let this get you down. Keep going. Keep going after what you want. And I wrote letters to the Academy every week telling them that I was still interested and um, to please keep me in mind. And I think I probably would have showed up on day one. Uh, if I hadn't got an acceptance letter. I think I would have actually showed up hoping that someone else had changed their mind or maybe just got nervous and didn't show up. Uh, I don't actually know if that happens, but I was ready to get on the bus and be there just because it was what I wanted. But I didn't have that mindset without the support of people around me that encouraged me to continue to go after what I wanted. So um, to kind of circle back, I, you know, I would say work hard, you know, be credible in what you do, have a good attitude. Um, be humble, like be willing to learn and, and take critiques in order to get better. Um, don't quit. Don't quit when times are tough. And, you know, if it's what you want and it's your purpose in life, then go after it. So along with your education at the academy, you earned a master's in international studies and a master's in business administration while studying in Europe. Can you share what your experience was like? Sure. Um, so first to start with, I, um, I graduated from the academy with a degree, um, a bachelor of science degree in space operations. And so it may sound a little bit strange that I all of a sudden I went to this international security studies and business administration, but it was really about um, getting out and exploring something different. I was just interested to kind of broaden my skills and broaden my thinking. 
And going to school in the United Kingdom absolutely gave me that opportunity because I think it's so important to surround yourself with people that don't look like you and don't act like you. You need to, you know, to get those differences of opinion and being in an international school where I was one of the only Americans was really exciting to just learn about a different culture and a different way of thinking. Um, it made me think differently about, you know, the way we do things in the United States. It made me just think differently in general. And um, we had some really good, interesting discussions. Uh, they weren't always easy discussions, but they were really good in terms of just getting somebody else's point of view um, and learning a little bit out about other people's cultures because we took the opportunity to share different holidays from different cultures. Um, we kicked it off with Thanksgiving, which I cooked for all my classmates, and then we kind of rotated through the different countries and their holidays. So it was, it was a really great opportunity to learn a little bit more outside of kind of my normal environment. Um, the other interesting piece about getting a master's and going on to an international school was that it was very unstructured compared to the academy. I mean, as you can imagine, the academy is very structured in time. And I showed up in England and it was very open and I really had to focus and learn how to build my own schedule as opposed to doing what somebody else always told me to do. Um, and so it was really kind of just a neat experience to have that as well and to figure out my own schedule, my own rules and figure out how I could excel in that environment as well. Seems like you learned a lot of responsibility there. I did, <laughs> and I had a lot of fun too, don't get me wrong. It's a pretty fantastic place to be. So in your work at the academy, you have the chance to observe your incoming cadets who are coming into a situation you've been in before. What advice would you give to help students prepare for the jump to college? Uh, I think one of the biggest struggles for me was time management. Um, just trying to figure out how to do it all and try to be good at it. Um, you know, it was an environment, there were a lot of different things and granted the academy has some different, um, you know, some of the different requirements in terms of military requirements, but trying to balance a heavy academic workload with trying to do physical fitness and trying to do all the other things and, um, you know, and, and have friends and do that kind of thing as well. It was just, it, it was hard at first to try to put it all together. Um, but really important to not let the academic slide because kind of once you get behind um, and you start that downhill slide, it's really tough to get back up. And so I think, you know, early on kind of setting a schedule for yourself and setting, you know, figuring out how to manage that time um, is really critical to go with that. I think, um, and I, I tell myself, this is the same advice I tell myself today. So it's not like I've learned it all and practice it all, but I, you sometimes just need to take a step back when it feels overwhelming and focus on what's most important. You know, what, what do I need to do right now? If I have 30 minutes of time, what is most important that I focus on right now? You know, what's my, what's the closest threat to me in terms of what is due, you know, what project is due or what do I need to get done? And that helped me in terms of time management because sometimes it just feels like overwhelming and there's so much going on, um, but really focusing on what's important right now um, and setting those boundaries, um, I think helped me to succeed. But I, it's something that we struggle with. I see cadets struggle with it all the time. Um, and to be honest today, when I'm trying to bounce, you know, at working from home now and teaching my kids and things like that, I still take a step back and ask myself, all right, what is most important that I do right now? Uh, so it's, it's advice that I, that I give to cadets, but it's also advice that I give to myself regularly. So on the topic of working with time management and everything, FIRST operates in very intense competitive environments and also under strict time restraints. What advice or specific stories would you share about keeping calm and making decisions under pressure? Yeah, it is, um, that is part of what I do as a pilot every day, um, whether it's flying and training, whether it's teaching students or, flying in combat, being able to make quick decisions under stress is, and it's an important skill to have, um, you know, not just in the flying world, but in everyday life. And I think for me, what has helped me and allowed me to succeed in some really difficult situations is um, 
to one, rely on training. Um, when I was flying a combat mission in Iraq in 2003, and my aircraft was hit with a surface to air missile, I mean, I had seconds to make a decision about what to do with my airplane. And I didn't have time to ask anybody for help. I didn't even have time to open our emergency checklist. I just had to react. And so I, I relied on the training, um, but that doesn't come overnight, right? You can't just be a decision maker in stressful situ situations overnight. It's training that leads up to it over time. I think the other key piece to this is not just training for kind of the normal every day, but a focus on planning for contingencies. And we do this in the flying world uh, through a technique called chair flying. And chair flying is a skill where you essentially, you sit down in a chair. If you have a cockpit display, you can put it in front of you, but you walk through a mission. You think through all the steps and all the things that could happen, that should happen. And then you take a step back and think about all the things maybe that could go wrong. Um, you know, and so in a competitive environment, it's just thinking through the, the competition before it happens and then also analyzing those contingencies. What are the things that might happen? And then what do you do? And so by chair flying, um, the broader term these days is visualization, but by thinking through a scenario in advance, it ensures that in that moment when we're under stress, that we can kind of take a step back and breathe because we've seen it before, or we've thought about it before. Um, and you know, there's actually science behind this that tells you that repeated exposure to similar situations leads to familiarity. And then when you're familiar with a situation, then you're less likely to feel fear and stress. I mean, it, think back to like your very first competition, and I'm sure there's a lot of nerves and, and stress, um, and that may carry through different competitions, but by the third or fourth or fifth, you're like, oh, I, I know what this is like, and I know how to deal with it. Uh, and so I think it's a combination of, of training, um, but then also, you know, taking the time to really think through a situation before it happens and not just thinking about how it should go, but how it could go as well. So while first is a competitive sport, teamwork and ideas such as cooperation are an integral part of how we operate. With the Air Force and Civil Air Patrol, you learn things such as the wingman concept that helps build teamwork. How has teamwork helped or impacted your career in life? Um, gosh, immensely is the short answer. Um, you know, I look at this, this idea of a wingman concept of having somebody there to provide you with mutual support is so important. Um, it's who you surround yourself with in terms of friends and family and people that will be there to support you um, in challenging times. You know, the idea of cooperation and competition is interesting because it is exactly how you survive at the academy. It's how I survived in pilot training because in the end, you're competing with your classmates for a class standing and how you perform determines what job you will get in the Air Force. Uh, and so, yes, you're competing with your classmates, but you wouldn't survive if you didn't work together. It was the same at pilot training. You know, we're all competing for to get what airplane we want. And the higher you are in the rank order, um, you're, you're more likely to get your first choice. But you can't get through pilot training on your own. I mean, you've got to study with other people and work with other people. And when you have a bad day and the flying doesn't go so well, you need to be able to come back from the mission and talk to your one, or one of your classmates and go, you know, this didn't go well and, and just kind of talk through it. And so, yes, it's competition, but you cannot survive without the cooperation piece as well. Uh, and so you'll, you know, that is that what you're learning now uh, translates in many different environments and many different career fields um, because yes, you need to compete, you need to do well, you need to be credible, but you also need to work well with others um, because if you don't, nobody really wants you on your team um, anyway. Um, but this idea of the wingman concept really originates from combat and we use it in everyday life. And uh, we use it to describe a lot of things in terms of having mutual support. Um, but for me, um, I look back at wingman concept and um, my combat mission in Iraq, and we always fly as a two ship. We don't fly by ourselves. Um, occasionally it's a four ship I mean, there's four airplanes, but we always have another airplane there with us because 
if something happens, you want to be able to turn to your wingman for help, for guidance, for support. And so when my airplane was hit, all I could do was fly the airplane. I mean, it was a very stressful situation. It wasn't responding to any of my control inputs. And so it was a struggle just to get the airplane under control and to fly. And so in that moment, when I told my flight lead, my wingman, that I was hit, he was immediately like just went into action and he knew what I needed. He knew to, he knew the support that I needed. Um, for example, when I told him I was hit and that I was in this emergency backup system, he immediately began directing me to fly west because that was what the location where the friendlies were, our troops on the ground. And he thought if I had to eject out of this airplane, that at least I would be over a friendly location instead of an enemy location. I did not have the brain bites to think about that at the time, but he did. And that's the idea, right? That your wingman is there to have your back and to provide you that mutual support. Um, it was incredibly important. Um, he, we had flown together for a few weeks in what we call combat pairs, meaning you're gonna fly with the same person. So you kind of get to know them, you know their strengths and weaknesses. And so we really, in that moment, because of this wingman concept and because we had flown together and worked together, we were able to overcome adversity and overcome a really difficult situation. Um, so absolutely critical to develop uh, the team concept and working together and supporting each other, even while competing, we're supporting each other um, in our endeavors. That's a really great story about teamwork. So every year, the teams in FIRST are given a broad set of instructions to design and build a robot that will successfully compete. And you're in charge of innovation integration at the Academy. What would your top three tips for teams who are responsible for design integration into implementation in a team atmosphere be? Um, I think one of the most important things when you have this team environment and you're tasked to create something new, different, that's maybe outside of our normal comfort zone, is it's really important to listen to everybody on the team. Um, in the military, we have a hierarchy, right? There's ranks and structures and there's senior members and then there's the lower levels of an organization. And one of the things that I have found is that some of our best ideas and most creative ideas come from new members or the lower levels of an organization. And so I, I think it's really important that we don't discount somebody's idea right away just because they're new. And often that means you have to ask their idea first because the people that are more experienced will sometimes step up and right away start talking. But if you actually take a chance to ask somebody that's new or lower ranking an idea, um, a lot of times they have really creative and innovative ideas because they're coming with a new approach. And so it's really critical to make sure you listen to every member on the team and create that environment where you know, the younger members or newer members um, feel like they have a voice and have, have the confidence to speak up. And that only comes if you have a good working team, right? That you know you can trust each other and, and share ideas and that people will listen. And so I think that's, that's one of the things um, that's really important. Um, I don't know if these are exactly in order, but I would also say that um, along with that, we need to think critically. Um, we can't always focus on the way we've always done things. We need to think about new ways. It's so easy to go, well, that's the way we've always done it, or that's the way we did it before. But I think it's really important to kind of stay, take a step back and ask ourselves, is there a better way to do it? Is there a different way to do it? Um, and really kind of critically think about our process and our approach, um, and maybe have somebody designated to be that person that's almost the um, as we call it in the Air Force, red air, right? The opponent, somebody that's going to, hey, is that really a good idea? Is that going to work? You don't want it to be a negative process, but just to think, kind of take a step back and have that critical approach um, to think differently, to think in a new way. Um, because we, it's very easy to kind of get boxed into the way we've always done it. Um, because sometimes it works and that's okay. Um, but it's really hard to get better uh, if you don't think outside your comfort zone and think about something new. Um, and then 
The third one, and again, not in any particular order, um, is I, something I touched on earlier as well, is planning for contingencies. So planning for when your project, when your design um, doesn't go so well, then how, what are you gonna do to adjust? Um, because inevitably in competition in life, uh, the mission doesn't go as planned. Things aren't always gonna go exactly like we want them to. And so we kind of have to take a step back and chair fly our mission, chair fly our competition and think about what might go wrong with our design and then how would we fix it? Um, so it's that planning for contingencies approach and, and know that just not to freak out when things don't go exactly as we plan, you know, and, and being able to respond and react when it doesn't. Um, so those are, those are a couple things. There's probably many more, but I would say those are three big ones in terms of um, having an innovative and, and um, uh, creative environment. So on the topic of thinking of things revolutionary and thinking outside the box, since most of the percentage of female students is actually rapidly growing within FIRST, what advice would you give to young women such as myself who are seeking to enter the traditionally male dominated fields that are actually changing now? Um, well, that's exciting to hear in terms of your organization. I think, um, you know, when I started flying um, and when I was first a fighter pilot, there were, I think, 32 women fighter pilots. And today there are 64. Um, that's not fantastic and we would like it to be better, um, but it's getting better, right? And so I think it's, it's important to see that progress in many male dominated career fields that women are feeling more comfortable joining um, and being part of that type of environment. I think the most important thing, the number one thing, because in the end, if you are credible and good at what you do, the rest just doesn't matter. Um, it's not easy going into a male dominated environment where you are a minority. But at the same time, I recognized that when I showed up to a fighter squadron for the very first time, I was going to be judged, as was every new wingman in a fighter squadron. Yes, it was a little bit different because I was one of the, well, I was the only female at the time. And that's, that's hard to go into that environment, but I just looked at it like, hey, I, of course they're going to judge me because I need to prove myself. And so, again, I go back to work hard and have a good attitude, but you absolutely have to be good at what you do. And if you're good at what you do, then the rest doesn't matter. Uh, and so I would say focus on being credible um, and having that good attitude. And I think that goes a long way to just setting you up for success. And looking to the future, what advice would you give to any of our listeners today if they were interested in pursuing a military career? Um, if it's of interest for you, then absolutely go for it. Um, I, you know, I, I have really enjoyed my time in the military. I'm um, getting ready to retire here um, next month. And um, I've had 23 years of service and it has absolutely been fantastic in terms of the opportunities, um, and things that I have been able to see and do has just been tremendous. Um, certainly there's been challenges along the way, but those challenges, you know, I'm looking back now, it's easy to say I'm thankful for them because they made me the person that I am today. Um, but if, if, if you're looking at the military as a career field, I highly encourage you, and this is really with anything you do, is to be prepared before you go. Uh, it is not easy, uh, you know, between you know, mental preparation and physical preparation is absolutely essential. I mean, it's like anything, you don't wanna go into something uh, unprepared. Um, you need to be ready for the challenges and certainly basic training, whether it's you know, an officer enlisted track, ROTC, OTS, the Air Force Academy or other military services, you absolutely have to go unprepared. Otherwise you'll just be more stressed and uh, it'll be you know, more difficult for you. Um, so go in prepared but also choose the path that's right for you. Um, you will find throughout your life, you're gonna get a lot of advice. And in the end, um, it's your life and you need to choose the path that works for you. Um, don't do something because somebody else wants you to do it. Do it because that's your goal, that's your dream. Because if you're gonna go into something that's challenging and difficult, 
the reason you survive and get through it is because you have that personal drive to achieve your dreams and your goals. Uh, trying to achieve it for somebody else is just difficult and it's no fun. Um, so you really need to focus on what your purpose is, what your why is, you know, why you choose to do something. Uh, and when you focus on something that's what you want um, and you'll be more interested in it and it will be, you know, those tough times won't be so difficult knowing that you're going after what you want. And for the people who are looking to grow or expand their skills and professional development for preparation and then just self-enjoyment, what speakers or books or TED Talks possibly do you recommend? Um, you know, I, I actually have more time right now than I have had in a long time. And I used to be the kind of person that would start a book and then finish it. And um, now I feel like I'm reading five different books because I'm so excited kind of about what's next and, and trying to improve myself. Um, I certainly, um, I, I certainly like to take a, a fiction book every now and then and just relax and, um, you know, kind of a way to decompress. Um, but I also really enjoy reading about um, other people and how they learned or how they explored, how they succeeded. So um, I'm reading a few books right now. One, um, I am reading about um, a book from Dr. Brene Brown, um, who really focuses on um, some um, ideas about leadership. And I, I'm always trying to improve myself and think of new ways to think about leadership. Um, I, that is something that I really try to spend some time on. Um, anything that I can do to kind of improve my own thoughts and my, my own ways of thinking. Um, and she has a great TED talk too about vulnerability. Um, she also has a great podcast out right now about dealing with stress and difficult times. And sometimes we need to be a little easier on ourselves and not um, put so much pressure on ourselves. Um, to always excel. Um, and, you know, if, if you have a rough day, sometimes it's like, all right, let's just figure out how to make tomorrow better. Um, and so I've really enjoyed um, reading about her work right now. Um, that's really kind of where my focus has been. Uh, what tips do you have for people on how to balance the uncertainty we're facing right now with long-term planning? How do you stay focused on an end goal while the world is so chaotic? Yeah, it's, it is hard right now. I mean, um, this is a different world we're living in. And I am a very, I would say, like type A person where I like to have things planned out. Um, and right now, I just, I'm not able to do that um, because there's so many unknowns. So we, we kind of make um, the best decisions we can in the moment. And I go back to something I said earlier is focus on what's most important. So right now, in this pandemic environment is really difficult. And there are a lot of distractors and things going on. But I think one of the most important things we can do is focus on what's most important, but also on what we can control. Um, because I think there are things you can control, there are things that you can influence, and then there are things where you really have no control over and it's just not worth stressing or worrying about. And so really trying right now to focus on what you can control and what's important. And I, I learned these things from flying. I mean, again, from my mission in Baghdad, in those moments of stress and fear and uncertainty, I really just had to take that step back and focus on right now, what can I control and what's most important? And then if you, you have that down, now you can kind of take a step back and look at, that, look at the things that you can influence and where you can make a difference. Um, and then those other secondary things that you have no control over, you know, right now, especially, they're just not worth worrying about. It's not worth it, worth additional stress in our lives um, that we don't already have based on kind of the current uh, pandemic environment. So it looks like we have a few questions from Twitch chat, actually. Sure. Uh, one of them is, what's your personal why? Um, my personal why, and you know, um, I'm assuming whoever wrote that may, may have some reference to Simon Sinek, who I have also read his book. Um, and he talks about how important it is as an individual to understand your personal why, but also if you're leading an organization that your team understands the why. Um, 
my personal why in terms of being in the Air Force and for serving as long as I had um, has really been knowing that in the job that I do, I have the ability to save lives and get people back home to their families safely. Um, because the A-10, the airplane that I fly, focuses primary mission-wise on close air support, meaning when our troops on the ground are in trouble, we're going to do everything we can to get them out of that situation and support them to eventually get them back home safely to their families. Um, that mission has really been my why of service. Um, now, I haven't flown the A-10 in a few years, and so, you know, it's, I look at what I'm doing now and my reason for coming back to the Air Force Academy where it all started for me, my why has really been to influence um, our next generation of leaders, to mentor our young cadets and, and help them, you know, based on my personal experiences, to share with them some of those lessons learned, um, you know, you don't really want everybody to have to go through the combat experience that I did, but there were so many lessons that I learned from it that I want to share those. And so really that has been my new why is sharing those lessons um, to help other people be better. Um, because in those moments of flying my airplane over Baghdad, um, there were pilots who had shared their stories with me. They had shared their lessons learned. They had shared how they survived difficult moments. And I honestly think, you know, you share those stories, even when and sometimes it shows weaknesses or things that you didn't do correctly, it helps other people be better. Uh, and so that has kind of been the transition of my why now is um, helping others to learn from some of the experiences that I've had um, in order to help them be better. So first is a program that values leadership and we talk about this as we're developing the leaders of this next generation as well. We have multiple awards that celebrate it. What are tips that you have for people to develop their leadership skills? Um, you know, especially as you're just starting out, I think one of the most important things, whether you're leading two people, a hundred people or a thousand people, is you really wanna create trust with your team. Um, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, but working to do things to create trust in an environment, um, just getting to know your team. Um, as a squadron commander, which was about 150 people, and then as a group commander, which was about 1,000 people, much harder to do in a large organization, I knew that I absolutely had to get out and talk to my team and get to know them and figure out what their strengths and weaknesses and concerns um, and really kind of develop that environment of trust. Um, Again, you have to do that by setting the example, right? By showing them, not just saying it, by showing them um, that you are there for them, that you will support them. That doesn't mean we're friends with everybody. It's, you can't always be a leader and be friends with everybody. Um, that's really difficult because you still have to hold um, your team and yourself accountable. Um, but if you do that and you hold yourself accountable, meaning if you make a mistake, you admit it, if you make a bad decision, you admit it. Um, if you don't have the answers, which to be honest, we, we don't have all the answers. There's no way we can. And so we ask our team for ideas. Uh, and by holding yourself accountable, that encourages trust with your team. Uh, and so I think, you know, even if you're in charge of two people or you're leading two people, um, these ideas still apply because you really want to get to know and establish this environment of trust. Um, and you do that by being a little bit vulnerable. Um, and a lot of people have this idea that vulnerability is weakness. I'm not talking about vulnerability in terms of a weapon system or things like that. I'm just talking about in a personal leadership role, being vulnerable means that you're open to new ideas, you're open to some risk, you're open to some uncertainty in the environment. And then you bring your team in and you ask them for ideas. You encourage them to bring their ideas to the table. You ask them their ideas first before you present your own. Um, and those are all things that we can do to establish a culture of trust. And then once you have that trust and you can explain you know, the why behind the reasons that your organization does something, people are more likely to follow them when they understand all of that. And so that communication is incredibly important. Um, to have open communication and kind of a back and forth 
um, especially when it means that, you know, you will take feedback as a leader as well. You're open, you're humble, you're willing to learn, you're willing to take critiques. Um, I think all of that goes a long way to establishing leadership. And, you know, I'm telling you about leadership after having served in the Air Force for 23 years and have had some very significant leadership roles along the way, um, but I had to start somewhere. And so I started in Civil Air Patrol and being in charge of just a few people. Um, you know, I started a captain of a sports team and my soccer team, you know, leading in that way. So there are a lot of different ways that you can lead um, and give it a try, right? You're not gonna be perfect. You're gonna fail along the way. There's things that are not gonna go well, but if you never give yourself the chance to try and throw your hat ring, then you're never gonna learn those skills. And so you gotta start somewhere. So another question from the chat, um, what was your first experience in a fighter jet like? It was awesome. <laughs> um, so the very first time that I flew the A-10 um, was really cool because um, you're by yourself. Um, there is no two-seat A-10s. Well, there, there were two made and I think they're in museums somewhere. One is out at Edwards Air Force Base. But the very first time you fly an airplane, the, the A-10 specifically, you're by yourself. Now we have plenty of time in the simulators before this, but to be in that airplane by myself, um, my wingman tucked in right behind me, making sure that I wasn't gonna do anything wrong was just awesome. Um, but the really cool thing about the A-10, if you've seen a picture of the A-10, it is surrounded by a, um, a very large Gatling gun and it sits underneath the airplane. And so um, the first time you shoot this enormous gun, you know, you can smell the gun gases, the, the jet vibrates and, um, you know, you're shooting at a practice target on the range, but you can see sparkles. Uh, and so when I look back at my first in the A-10, it wasn't so much flying the airplane for the first time. It was actually shooting the gun for the first time. That was just a um, really incredible piece of machinery. And so it was, um, it was a lot of fun to do. Um. What was your proudest moment in the military career? Oh, proudest moment in my military career. I think um, the opportunity to be a commander. Um, because in a, as a commander, you are responsible for, you know, a lot of young people. And you have the ability to influence their lives and be a part of their lives um, and change them and, and, and encourage them. and you have so much impact on their future and whether or not they stay in the Air Force and their families. Um, I think being a commander and, and having that responsibility was really, um, I mean, it was just, it's an, it was an honor. And I'm proud of, I was proud of my airmen then. I just so enjoyed getting to know them and them teaching me things. Um, sometimes you're a commander of organizations where you don't have the expertise. As a group commander, you know, I was a pilot, right? But I, in my unit, I had firefighters, I had doctors, I had lawyers, I had civil engineers. And, you know, I didn't, I, I learned what they did through, you know, briefings and I got feedback. But when I went out to see them, you know, I had my, one of my youngest airmen teach me how to drive a front loader. And I had never done that before. And um, it was vulnerable because I was really worried I would mess something up, but it was so cool to have my youngest airman teach me how to do something. Likewise, my airmen in Honduras were firefighters and I really wanted to learn more about what they did and how they did it. And they said, ma'am, jump in the burn house with us, which I thought was crazy. Um, but they put me in a fire suit. They taught me how to use a suit, how to use a fire hose. And I got to go put out a fire in the burn house, which is a controlled environment. But I absolutely loved it. I mean, I just, I loved getting to know them. Um, I'm proud of what they've accomplished. Uh, you know, just to see people that you lead do great things and excel is so rewarding. And so I think that is likely my proudest moment is just being in charge of those young airmen who did amazing things. And to know that I was part of it in some way, just to watch them excel was, was, um, was really exciting. So another achievement of yours from your military career is you earned a Distinguished Flying Cross for heroism 
And while at Oshkosh, I had the chance to hear you speak about your experiences as a, a combat fighter pilot. Are there any other stories you would like to share? Um, well, I'm happy to share that story specifically. I'm also happy to share any others, uh, depending upon what you had in mind. Uh, it's up to you. Okay. Um, so I will, I'll give you a little bit of that story. I know I've touched on it briefly, but I'll give you a little bit more of the background and then I'll share another story um, to tie in with that as well. Um, but the, the mission that I've referred to and the, the mission that I shared at Oshkosh um, happened in 2003. And our unit was deployed uh, to Kuwait to support missions in Iraq as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And we deployed as a squadron, which again, you know, when you talk about mutual support, wingman concept, it was so nice to be around my brothers and sisters in some really difficult and challenging times. Um, but on this day, we were tasked to fly up to Baghdad and provide close air support. We would take off from Kuwait, fly an hour up to Baghdad, and then wait um, in these stacks to hold. The situation on the ground had gotten so intense that we were literally just aircraft stacked up around Baghdad waiting for the call to provide close air support. And on this day, the weather was terrible. We couldn't see the ground below. And so we just didn't know if we were going to be effective. If there was anything that we would be able to do. Um, so we showed up in the stack after getting gas from an airborne tanker. And um, we, didn't, we didn't wait long. Um, a controller from the ground, um, very quickly came over the radio, very frantic and said, yard 05, this is advanced 33, we're taking fire, we need immediate assistance. And you know, this is that moment, right? The hair on the back of my neck stands up, I, my heart is beating, my adrenaline is pumping because I know that lives are on the line and we need to do everything we can to go and help them out. Unfortunately, the weather's not very helpful and so my flightly decides we're gonna fly right over the target location and try to get down below the weather. Our ground controller tells us that our friendlies are on the west side and the enemy is on the east side of the river. And uh, we can't see it. So we just plot the information on our maps and then we decide that it's time. We gotta get down there as quickly as we can. So my flight lead starts his spiral down below the weather and then he tells me it's my turn. And so I look down and I see a hole in the clouds and decide that I can make my way through. Uh, and so I dive down below the weather and then get down below the clouds. And now I can see this firefight and it is um, a firefight happening just back and forth across the river. It's, it's surreal because this is what we train for, but I had never seen anything like it. I mean, that's just flashes and smoke and, um, you know, just this environment of a firefight happening. And then at about the same time, I start to see these like puffs of gray and white smoke and bright flashes and they're right next to my cockpit. And so I know at this point that not only is there a firefight happening in, across the river, um, but they're shooting at us too. And so my flight lead and I decide that we don't have a lot of time we need to get in there as quickly as we can, but we're only gonna make just a few passes, kind of assess the situation and then climb back up and get our energy back because we are so low. So my flight lead goes first and he does his passes and then I set up for my last pass and I check my distance from the target, I check my altitude, I make sure all my switches are set correctly um, and then I roll in. And my target is to take out the enemy below a bridge and so I point my nose right below the bridge. I refine my aim point and I hit the pickle button, which is our weapons release button. And seven rockets come out of the airplane instantly. Um, but then I got to pull up, get away from the ground. We call it a safe escape maneuver, trying to get away from the ground, um, away, away from the enemy, away from threats, and really try to climb back up. And uh, pull an off target away from the ground and a left hand turn when I just feel and hear a large explosion at the back of the I knew immediately I was hit. There was no doubt in my mind. The jet nose over, points at Baghdad, and I can see Baghdad below. Uh, it's getting closer. And I honestly, I know I might have to eject, um, but the last thing I wanna do is eject into the hands of the enemy. And so I know that I need to make every second count. Uh, I quickly try to analyze the situation. You know, I, I can't control the airplane, it's not responding. So my next step is analyze the situation. And I've got a master caution light. I've got a caution panel that tells us what's wrong on the airplane. It's lit up like a Christmas tree. 
And then I realized that I have no hydraulic pressure. The reservoir light is on and my hydraulic gauges for both the left and the right hydraulics are empty, um, which is why I have no control over the air pump. Um, so at this point, I know I have very little time and I need to make every second count. Um, so I have to set aside my fear. I just, in that moment, try to regain my composure and engage a backup emergency system. And um, thankfully my airplane starts to climb out and away from Baghdad. Um, it's kind of the first moment where I actually think I might make it out of there alive. Um, but when my airplane was hit, like I said, I, I didn't have time to ask anybody for help. Even though my wingman was there with me, I didn't have enough time. I didn't have time to open our emergency checklist and I just reacted. I relied on my training uh, and my training kicked in. Um, and I'm very fit, thankful for that. Uh, but now that the airplane is flying, I gotta get it. I still need to get out of Baghdad. I think that if I still have to eject that my chances of survival and escape will be much better if I'm outside the city. And so we make our way outside the city and then my flight lead eventually pulls up alongside of me and uh, says, hey Casey, you've got hundreds of holes in the fuselage and tail section of your airplane and then a hole about the size of a football in your back horizontal stabilizer, which is kind of our back tail section of the airplane. And, um, you know, I didn't know what to think. It didn't sound very good to me, but um, you know, the airplane was still flying and I was very thankful for that. Um, I am incredibly thankful to the people that designed and built the airplane because they made an airplane that could survive really intensive battle damage. Um, and I had an hour to fly the airplane back uh, to home base back in Kuwait. Uh, I will tell you, it was very difficult to fly, um, you know, from a mentally challenging perspective, just worried about what might happen when I attempted to land the airplane. But also from a physical perspective, um, flying an A-10 in manual reversion is um, it's very heavy and it's a really heavy stick. And so I had this um, a pod, an electronic countermeasure pod out on my left wing and it was very heavy. And because I emergency jettisoned all of my ordnance to help myself climb, when I got hit, I had this one pod out on the left wing, which meant the entire way back, my airplane just wanted to do these rolls the full way back, and I had to continuously fight it. Um, but I'm thankful because, you know, I mentioned those stories from other pilots that came before me, and they had talked about flying in this backup system. They had talked about flying in manual reversion, and so I knew the stories that they shared, and that helped me survive. You know, I look at those um, pilots that came before me as kind of guardian angels, right? They weren't with me their stories were. And that's why I think it's so important that we share lessons learned and we share stories like this because you can help other people be better and you can help other people learn from them. Uh, and so, you know, that was a very, very tough mission. It was incredibly challenging, um, but I'm thankful for it because it taught me a lot of lessons. Um, landing the airplane was um, very challenging. Uh, to be fair and honest, I was scared. Um, I was scared because I was worried about what would happen when I attempted to land. Um, I knew that I could still go back to friendly territory and eject, but um, you know that it wasn't really what I wanted to do because the airplane was flying at this point now very well. I had a very experienced wingman with me and the winds back at our home base were down the runway. And so I felt very confident that I could try to land the airplane, um, but it was tough. And as I crossed um, at about 60 feet to go, I crossed the landing threshold and the airplane just starts this quick roll to the, the left. And I'm just thinking, is, am I gonna make it? Do I even have time to eject? Um, and so I quickly yank the stick back and the airplane levels out. And now I'm just thinking, please let me make it. You know, I've got 30 feet to go, eventually 10 feet, the main gear and then the nose gear touch down and the airplane is on the ground. I was incredibly relieved. Um, I still had to get the airplane stopped, but now I'm on the ground and all of my backup emergency systems, all those things worked exactly as advertised. And I was able to bring the airplane to a stop uh, and then get out and see the damage. Um, I don't have any pictures with me today, but behind me, you can see the, the tail there where it says FT987. That's my tail for my airplane. Um, it you know took some tremendous damage, um, you know, hundreds of holes, uh, completely damaging our flight control systems, but it still brought me home safely. Um, you know, but it wasn't just the airplane that got me home safe. You know, it was an entire team out there supporting me. 
We had controlling agencies that cleared the airspace for us. We had F-15s to provide uh, air support overhead in case there were enemy aircraft. Um, we had a, a team of rescue helicopters, if I had to eject, were there. And then the crash recovery team was there waiting for me. Uh, and then most importantly, like I talked about my wingman who helped me in that moment and who helped me get back safely. So it truly was um, a team effort. Um, my airplane never flew again. Unfortunately, it was uh, too damaged. Um, they couldn't fix it, um, which was a little bit sad, but they took all the parts out of it to um, help our maintenance team have additional um, parts and pieces to fix our other airplanes. Um, so it didn't fly again, but I was able to get back in the air the next day. Um, and that was tough. Um, that was April 8, 2003. And what had happened is that an A-10 pilot had been shot down in Baghdad. And that day on April 8th, my job was to assist in combat search and rescue, meaning my airplane, my two ship was gonna fly up there and do everything we could to help coordinate his rescue. Um, you know, when you face challenging situations, um, you gotta figure out a way to move on. And for me, that was a really difficult time and a difficult moment, but I really had to learn the lessons from it and then kind of move on because there was still war going on. And I knew that my brothers and sisters were counting on me. Um, so it was really important for me to get back in the air and to be there for this pilot because I knew they were there for me as well. Um, you know, I've, I have flown the A-10 for a long time now and I have been part of this Air Force community and been part of really incredible, amazing teams. And when I look back on those combat missions and I look back on the lessons learned, I think the thing that still stands out to me most is the team and my brothers and sisters who helped me get through a really difficult and challenging time. Uh, we're not very good at asking for help, uh, especially us fighter pilots, uh, but I have learned over the course of my career and the course of time that it is okay to ask for help. It is okay to rely on your team, right? That whole idea of even if you're competing with somebody, um, you still need to have cooperation because in the end it makes us all better. Uh, so those are probably two of my most vivid combat missions and uh, memories. Um, and yes, they were challenging, but have taught me some incredible lessons as well. So I believe we have time for one more question. Uh, how do you see the future of robotics and STEM evolving in the future? It is, a, it is truly an exciting time. I mean, if you look at the fact that we just stood up, stood up the U.S. Space Force, I mean, it's, it is exciting um, in terms of technology and capability, um, you know, in terms of what we look at in the Air Force is an expanding realm of both space and cyber, um, but really trying to look at these transformational capabilities and you know how to do things better and faster and safer and how do we do that? And a lot of the things that are coming up as game changers in the next 35, 50 years, you know, whether it's robotics or AI, um, you know, swarm technology, but looking at different ways to doing, at doing things, um, it is incredibly exciting. Um, you know, as pilots, we always worry that the um, that it's going to mean that we're going to be, um, you know, promoted out of a job that uh, we'll have airplanes that fly themselves, um, which is a little bit sad, but at the same time, pretty exciting to know that we have these new technologies and capabilities. Um, but those are just a few of the things. I mean, there are so many, um, but those are kind of the the current focus and environment. Um, of expanding our, you know, the way we look at things and looking at it from a different perspective, thinking outside of our comfort zone, thinking outside of the traditional nature of things. Um, it's really kind of that creative and critical thinking that helps us to um, gain those transformational capabilities. Thank you so much for joining us today. I believe Absolutely. we are out of time now. <laughs> so Chris is now back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> wow, that story, absolutely amazing. Uh, and the, the whole interview, um, thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us and our community. Absolutely. Uh, a huge inspiration uh, to me, uh, hopefully, I'm sure to everyone watching, but uh, just a, I can't think of a better way for us to end this, uh, these live virtual conferences than this conversation we just had, the, all the ways you tied your experiences back to uh, the same things we're trying to instill in, in the young people in our program. 
Well, thank you so much for having me. I mean, it's a, it's a, you have such a great organization. I had so enjoyed um, meeting Peyton and many of the other students um, while I was at Oshkosh. And so I'm thankful for the opportunity to just spend some time with you and to share some ideas and lessons learned um, and uh, hopefully um, encourage everybody to, to look beyond just kind of their normal comfort zone and encourage them to go after what they want um, because it's so important um, to have young leaders today working hard to be good at what they do. Wow. Well, thanks for those messages. We really appreciate it. And Peyton, thank you for being such a fantastic host. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And that was, that was great. So uh, thank you. Uh, good luck to you. Stay safe and healthy. Um, and congratulations on a, an amazing career and an upcoming retirement. Uh, we wish you the best of luck. Uh, and now that you'll have a little bit more time on your hands, I think in the spring of 2021, we may have a state championship here uh, in Indiana that we, we'd, we'd love to have you come visit, maybe be a Absolutely. part of our, <laughs> we'll yeah, extend that invitation. <laughs> it would be a lot of fun. I don't normally speak for Renee, our president of First Indiana Robotics, but I think I can speak for her when I say you'd be more than welcome to be uh, a guest at our uh, state championship. Well, I hope the, uh, the world is a safer place then <laughs> and we can all get back to traveling. Uh, but thank you. I really appreciate the invite. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're going to now segue on to our, our final piece, uh, which really is just a thank you so much. It's just a, uh, a chance here um, to just kind of put a wrap on this, uh, these virtual, these live virtual conferences. And so really with that, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna introduce Renee Becker-Blau, our president, who's got a few final words. We're gonna, and I think uh, Priya uh, from our student board, uh, but first we'll hear from Renee and uh, I'll be right back. Yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you everyone so much for, um, you know, and Peyton and for uh, Kim for that, that last great session. Um, that was such a great overview of leadership and some of those different um, aspects that the FIRST program brings to these students. And so I think that kind of ending on that high note was such a fantastic interview is right where we wanted to be um, with these virtual conferences. Uh, so looking back at the past couple of weeks as we've engaged with our community through these virtual events, um, you know, we've kind of gone from uh, inviting people from, you know, Disney, who are also first senior mentors in Florida and have mentored in uh, the Indiana area, to inviting um, people from all over, you know, to come and kind of discuss how we can provide support to um, the LGBT plus of first community, uh, along with some of the, you know, women are first discussions that we've had as well. And so we've kind of had a broad range of, you know, these cultural topics that can benefit a lot of teams, but we've also had some amazing technical programs. So, you know, Peter um, Argos from uh, 1018 has come on and talked a little bit. We've had our student board of directors members who have been giving us fantastic technical content as well, in addition to some of these cross program aspects. So learning more about the Lego League program um, and what our teams are doing in addition to being able to have our student board of directors kind of have this engagement um, and talk about, you know, FTC and the uh, different, um, you know, aspects of the first tech challenge program. So, you know, with all of that, I think we've had a truly fantastic uh, virtual conference. And this definitely is not the end. It's just the, uh, we're kind of concluding the consistent, you know, Thursday and Friday sessions. And, you know, we're kind of transitioning towards doing more one-off activities um, and engaging a little bit with some of the organizations in Indiana as we move on. And so that's kind of an overview of where we've been. Um, and to kind of help wrap up this session, you know, we have our student board of director member, um, Priya, who's been a huge advocate um, of this program for the past two years as you volunteered. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to go through and had a couple of questions for our student board members regarding um, some of their favorite sessions and some key highlights so that we can call those out for people to go back and take a look at if they're interested. So Priya, uh, looking at the you know sessions that you've either been a part of or have tuned in for, what is one of your like must see sessions? Like you were super excited about it, and you would tell people, yes, they have to go back and check this out. I think my favorite session, and I actually rewatched this one, was um, the interview I did with Dave Lavery. He's a director 
at NASA for space operations. And he was just so like vibrant about everything that um, he does. And he really like his passion for the program really shows. And he had lots of like really interesting stories. Um, definitely hope that I get to interact with him again sometime. He was just so amazing. And I think that everyone needs to see that interview. I love it. I, you know, that's a brilliant example. Um, I remember there was this time at the world championship where Dave had kind of had this VR goggle and you could put it on and then you take a couple steps for it to like tune in and you would, you were, it's like you were on Mars, but then you would turn around and you got to see the, the Mars Rover. And so that kind of interaction at the world championship was just this really cool moment. Um, you know, where a group of students from Indiana were able to check that out. Um, and, and, you know, it was, it was kind of cool to have them on the show. That was awesome. Uh, when you went through this, you know, so one of the, the ones that I've particularly enjoyed was also the, um, the Canadian Youth Council that we got to interview with. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, like, what that meant um, as a student board of directors member and kind of um, what sort of effect that it has had um, on you or, you know, talking with them or making new friends and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, with our SBOD, um, we've been given like these opportunities to really help out and organize these like events and like projects and like being able to connect kind of with like equivalents, I guess, from like a different um, sort of area, them doing different projects and um, kind of like was pretty eye opening because it makes you think about how different people do things. And also I think it made us think of new ideas on how to kind of refine the SBOD for next year since we're a rolling committee. But I think with that specific call, I think there's just something so fun about having so many people on a call and like so many different um, experiences and things. Like we had the two episodes and what I liked about that was that like, it's really the start of something really great. Like we're totally planning to collaborate with them at some point. Um, but yeah, so keep an eye out for that and whatever we come up with. I like it. And, you know, thinking back, I know one of my favorite sessions was the LGBTQ plus a first round table discussion, um, along with a few of the other round tables that we had. We had the women are, you know, first in robotics session. Uh, there was one with reinvented magazine. Um, were there any pieces um, that you kind of learned there that were, you know, really interesting or dynamic that you think are worthwhile to go back and check out? Um, yeah, so I got to also in, uh, interview or like panel ask a bunch of MCs and game announcers. And again, like that's another fun one where there's just a ridiculous amount of people on a call. But like, I think the special thing about um, like the talent team is that like, um, just by nature of them being MCs and game announcers that they're all really fun and like engaged people that are really bringing their energy even through virtually. And like, I think it kind of like puts in perspective like that aspect of competitions is probably something that I miss a lot like just having like MCs and game announcers of sporting event like and being able to interact with them and hearing their stories was really special. Absolutely. That, you know, I have a fond memory of that one um, because my, my husband started teasing me afterwards because you had asked me that question of, well, Renee, like, what's your favorite game announcer MC? And, and Danny, I said all of them because, you know, we've, I've recruited all of them to, to our state. And um, Danny, Danny reminded me that I, he's, he's my favorite MC and game announcer. So that was kind of a funny conversation after the fact. But it was fun to see such dynamic speakers um, via a webinar and so that was kind of a cool and different opportunity there yeah and like I think like I want to say like MCs and game announcers they're pretty like token um, like celebrities in like the first world and like seeing them all in one place like talking to each other which is not normal like you see usually like one or two of them together at the same time um, but like seeing like Corey and um, Dave and like everyone from different regions was just really awesome it was, and I think Indiana is really lucky um, because we do have a lot of MCs and game announcers from different areas that come in and help support our programs. Um, you know, it's kind of something that we've you've built up over time, so. And then we followed that up with the Nick Hamas interview, which was also really special because I think he's been a pretty involved member of First Community as a whole too, so yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's always a good time. Nick and I were roommates back in college. Uh, I always like to remind people of that. But um, it's one of those moments where it's kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, Nick can come on and he can talk about, you know, the career opportunities and, you know, what's Google like and how he he's kind of done these amazing things by traveling around the world. That was also an absolutely fantastic session as well. Yeah. So uh, one of the other ones that I was able, we were able to facilitate was um, like how to create your own go-kart with Katie Wyden. Did you, were you able to tune into that one? Yeah, did I did watch it. <laughs> I think um, that was special for kind of a different reason that it kind of gave, um, you know, like watching a lot of like virtual seminars can be kind of like, um, like one-sided, I guess, but I think the aspect kind of gives the audience more of like an incentive, not even to make your own go-kart, but to do something, right? Like, just like, you guys can still learn, like find, re revive your like love for everything it is that we do here. And I think that session was also special because like, it's Katie, but <laughs> um, so yeah, just like, you know, like if go-kart's not your thing, like go DIY something, go learn something new, like, we got to come back next year stronger than ever. So this is the time. <laughs> I I will freely admit that uh, after that session, I went and accumulated myself a go-kart. It doesn't have a battery right now, but uh, I, I do have a, the chassis of a go-kart and it, it can roll. So I bought the tires and the hubs and all that fun stuff. So I definitely was inspired from that one. It was pretty good. So thinking about the some of those different panels, um, one of the one of the fun kind of outcomes, uh, there was a woman our first robotic session. We talked a little bit about um, you know engaging uh, young women or volunteers in the program, and one of the cool outcomes was actually I started doing um, like I coordinated a brunch afterwards because the the girls had such a great or the young women had such a good time chatting together. It was like oh let's do a bot brunch, and so that was kind of a fun um, outcome from that. That was a little bit surprising. But they had a lot of really great feedback um, and ideas for teams on how to, you know, build uh, confidence and really have an inclusive environment. I liked that a lot. What did you think about some of the tips there? Well, I think that, like, I don't specifically remember who said this, but, like, um, and I'm not sure, it might have even been in another interview that we talked about, but um, the kind of importance of, like, role models, I guess, and even just having that panel in general, having people as role models, because the team that I was on, we didn't have a lot of female technical mentors. So like, of course, it's not intentional. Like, no one um, is like, oh, yeah, we'll just all the girls have to go to business or whatever. But like, if you see mostly female mentors on the business team, and you see mostly male um, technical mentors, things kind of just like follow their path. So kind of the importance of being even really open with like, um, how you include people in like projects and things is really important when you don't have those role models. So like, even like if you're an ally, like being a really good ally to make sure that you're creating a good environment for people to still come and join your organization. Absolutely. And, you know, kind of thinking about that. So, I, you know, we've established we've had some great sessions, we've gotten great individuals doing these one on one interviews. Um, but I also think that, uh, you know, looking at the different topics, what sort of things would you love to see in like a pre-recorded session that we could do, you know, this summer? So like, what haven't we covered that is missing? Um, I really want to do, um, I really, before the season got renewed, I wanted to do more um, team showcases. Of course, now robots will change and stuff, but um, maybe less robot showcases, but I want to see how teams operate kind of just like, um, like, what their design processes, how they kind of uh, have their leadership structure set up, just even just to learn more about like small team versus large team, maybe not like a panel, but a series about just showcasing all the amazing teams that we have here and the different ways that they're able to really uh, make things better every year. I, I feel like that's a great time to, you know, plug in the fact that we are working on collecting these kind of mini showcases from teams. So we had two that were shared um, yesterday from teams around the Kokomo area, um, 45 and 3940. Um, is that the type of like showcase you're looking for? I know Mar has been doing, or sorry, the FMA <laughs> has been doing something like that. Um, is that kind of what you think would be helpful yeah. and exciting? Yeah. Awesome. Just like being able and like, plus like, we miss all our robot buddies, you know, we want to see what 
1720s been up to <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> A hundred percent. And I mean, I think that there are so many teams out there. Like I, I know that, you know, people from 1720 and 447 and 829 have started some, and Michigan City, have they've been doing some amazing work related to creating um, personal protective equipment. And I just can't, you know, communicate how proud and excited I am to see that they are still contributing and changing the well, li lives of people in their community. I think that that's brilliant. And exactly what, you know, the first program is really all about, like, taking a problem in your community and finding a solution for it. So are there any other like technical topics that you think, you know, the community would really find really helpful, um, you know, in a pre-record session this summer? Or do you feel like most of those were covered? I would love to do like some sort of tutorial series too. That'd be cool. Like um, with any kind of like something that can be taught virtually like CAD or, um, maybe any programming but like just someone I don't know I'm not like super great at CAD but probably someone we could figure out but um just kind of go through like maybe a 10 part and by the end they can design like a kit bot or something <laughs> I like that that yeah. sounds like it would be a really great session I know that like on shape is an example of a CAD software um that's easy to access from you know at home computers and things like that and so maybe that's you know, a great direction to start taking some of those standard CAD skills we'd normally have with like Inventor or at these in-person um, IU or Purdue forums and maybe transitioning them to like an online, you know, weekly opportunity or something like that. I like it. So, you know, with the student board of directors, I know this hasn't been easy. Um, it is your, you know, senior year, you would have gone through and like walked to graduation and you're off to college, you know, in the fall. But I just have to say that it has been so exciting to kind of see how the student board of directors members, um, you, your peers, and then those who have come on this this past year have kind of grown and expanded in this activity. Um, I will freely admit that, especially like going through like the, you know, how people enjoy like pre prepping for things and some of the ways people learn um, that I more often than not tend to throw you guys out and say, all right, go for it uh, with very little warning. And I, I've just been very impressed at how well you've been able to take that and kind of spin it into, okay, Renee says go. What does that actually mean? So thank you for all of your contribution. Um, and what have, what have you seen from your point of view in terms of like the growth from this experience? I think that my, uh, or junior year, so last year, we are still kind of like figuring things out a little bit. And uh, like, I think that we didn't have that much direction in which like, um, not even like on how to like execute things, but like on what our options were. But like, mm -hmm. I think that this year we've been a lot more involved with you and Chris, which like at like some points, like, so like during the fall, we were able to kind of brainstorm and really understand like, there's so many things that we can do. And then in this like second semester when we can like kind of execute everything, the advocacy kind of really kickstarted like a lot of our like rapid involvement, I guess. And then like now we're able to really see like what our strengths are with all of the members being able to bring something different to this platform. So for example, like uh, some of our projects that we are going to do during competitions were like the round tables, the bulletin boards, but like those are also things that are not always so like um don't always optimize everyone's skills and like through this we've been able to see like why um these members of like teams over indiana have been so appreciated and validated about their skills because they really brought their best i think um through this virtual conference um but yeah <laughs> i think um it's gotten a lot better and i it can only go better from here <laughs> I like it. Uh, so what's next from the student board of directors? You know, you guys have really kind of driven a lot of these different pieces. Um, you know, we've kind of reached a point where it's like, you know, now is about the time that schools will be wrapping up, AP tests are taking place. It's a good natural break point for this virtual conference. But, you know, we know that we won't really slow down. Um, so what do you see kind of coming next on the pipeline? Okay, so we kind of want to see like, after all these panels, all the roundtables, we've kind of hopefully sparked some inspiration in your mind while everything's kind of gloomy. 
But this summer, we really want to engage with the Finn community in a way that's a little bit more competitive. And since we didn't get that competitions this year, um, we want to have a hackathon this summer. And we want to see the best problem solving um, that hopefully you can bring to the table. And we'll release more information about it soon. But there'll be more competitions throughout the summer that you can kind of enter. and our different student board members will lead committees on judging. And I think it's gonna be really exciting. And I think we're gonna get some really awesome entries. Perfect, I love it. I think that that sounds like it'll be a good time. I know that we're not going to really share too much until after, I think it was Memorial Day, right? Cause we want people to get the AP tests out of the way, finish up the school pieces. Like we kind of just need some time to wrap those pieces up. Um, but I'm looking forward to, you know, sharing more about that and kind of seeing where the student board's gonna, gonna go with a hackathon. That sounds great. All right. So with that, uh, Chris, I think that there are a few different pieces we wanted to share with the teams regarding how to find the information, resources, and all those fun pieces. I think I'm gonna hand it back to you to kind of help wrap us up here. Great, thank you so much, Priya. It's been such a joy to work with you uh, and the student board, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you guys, this year you brought a lot of energy and it was so great to have you at the Capitol uh, those the two times that we were there in January, then back in March, uh, the just that kind of leadership, and then the presentations that you've been able to give, uh, it it helps. Uh, the to have the community hear from you is more important uh, because we can go out and tell people what we hear our students say, but it's it's the impact of having you actually tell your story. Uh, that helps and will help us continue to grow. So, and congratulations to you and your future at Indiana University. Thank you. Uh, I know you're going to do well down there. Uh, and yeah, so uh, really where we're moving forward, uh, all these sessions, the ones that uh, you and Renee were just talking about, the great thing is that they are all still out there for people to go back and watch. We've put them on our YouTube channel. And I, I dropped a link in the Twitch chat uh, for the, um, from the, um, the, to our YouTube channel. Uh, and, uh, and then if people want to go back and watch those, the nice thing is we broke those sessions down on each of the, um, the virtual conferences so that if there's a particular session they want to see, they can just, you know, slide the bar uh, to that particular session. So we went in and put time marks on those. And, uh, and um, the uh, moving forward then, all of our pre-recorded content that we're gonna continue to do, uh, we're going to put those straight out to our YouTube channel. Uh, then we'll be utilizing our social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, to continue to update the community on whenever we uh, have those uh, new pieces out there. Uh, whether it's training, technical, community building pieces, more interviews uh, with people in our community. Uh, and these are really are going to be great tools, we think, for us uh, into perpetuity for training. Uh, the, the FTC engineering notebook conversation, uh, I, I was just blown away by uh, the level of professionalism. I shouldn't have been because our students are awesome. But the, uh, that conversation was so good and just on its own is a fantastic training piece for any FTC team. Uh, it, brand new, looking to dive into notebooks for the first time, a team that maybe has struggled with their notebook, uh, it wants to up their notebook game, uh, or even teams that feel like they've, they've been doing really well with engineering notebooks, it's still a great one just to go back and watch uh, and listen. So we've got a great community giving uh, great, uh, great, content. So I would, uh, a call to action for folks watching is to go back to your teams, uh, see what it is that you do well, that you need to share with the rest of the community and, and let us know, reach out to us, Renee, myself, uh, and we'll set up a, an opportunity for you to uh, record those sessions. Uh, or if it's, if you know, if you don't want to do a, a session like this, that's pre-recorded, certainly put together uh, a PowerPoint or PDF files, we can get those onto our website. We have a whole uh, team resource section on our website. Uh, so yeah. And then we just have the, I think what we're gonna end with uh, 
is that we are going to to kind of put an end to this. We've got a short little, little very short, like one minute, uh, to thank all the participants that have taken part in this. Uh, I'm gonna maybe just close us out uh, with that for the Finn Nally. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. That's exactly why, uh, you know, we went with Finn is because, you know, we could have been very classy and been like, oh, final finale, like French noir. Um, and instead I get, I get, you know, it's a water game. It's sharks. Finn equals shark equals water game. So, That's right. I well, love our community. And, and, yeah. And we have more shark fins uh, coming for the community and more Finn related uh, content. So, uh, all right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and close us out with the showing of this video. Uh, as soon as that rolls, we're gonna uh, wrap this thing up. Thank you again to everybody, the people who've participated in these fantastic conversations, the people who watched and asked great questions, uh, to just to everyone behind the scenes. I wanna give a big personal shout out to some of our production folks, uh, Brad and Chase specifically for uh, helping us technically get through some of the stuff and Hugh Meyer, thank you uh, early on for getting us set up with some awesome streaming opportunities. Uh, we can't do this without our volunteers. We can't do any of it. Uh, and our volunteers have come through big for us even in this virtual time. So thank you to the entire FIRST community. Uh, and uh, with that, we will roll our thank you.